Dr. Collins, thank you very much for being with us. Happy to be with you today. All right, you led a team of scientists that read out the 3.1 billion letters that are in each of our cells, the DNA letters, remarkable. What has pleased you most since that discovery was announced in 2000 that science has been able to actually do with that science? Well, I'm a physician as well as a scientist and my goals for studying the human genome are very much tied up with the hopes that this would provide medical benefits. And I think those are coming true. And that is perhaps the most gratifying aspect of what's happened in the last nine years. We have, by having this instruction book laid out in front of us, begun to understand why some people are at risk for diabetes or cancer or heart disease and give them a chance to do something about that before the disease strikes. So individualized prevention. And we've also begun to learn things about the details of diseases like cancer that have led us to wholly new ideas about treatment that we wouldn't have been able to discover any other way. Dr. Collins, when the discovery was announced by the Clinton administration, you worked with his speechwriters to describe the Human Genome Project and the DNA mapping as the language of God. Why bring God into the mapping of DNA? Well, I'm a believer in God, and so was the president and the speechwriter, and so are, in fact, most people. And the idea that the mapping of the DNA might be seen as reducing humans to more materialistic creatures worried me, because I don't think that's the proper conclusion. If you see God's hand in creation, and that includes us, and what we've done is to read out our own instruction book written in this marvelous language of DNA, then in many ways we are looking at God's language, so perhaps we should call it that. Okay, so Language of God is the title you've chosen for your best-selling book, so maybe this is no surprise. We're going to bring you a book club now that has been interacting with Listen Up TV about your book. And uh, this is a group of doctors and entrepreneurs in Canada who have been challenged by your ideas of science and faith. And so they've pitched us a few questions. So here goes, uh, we're gonna do some of their questions for you. Dr. Collins, your book demolishes the concept of a young earth theory. So what about Adam and Eve? What does it do to that concept? So in my book, I go through the scientific evidence for the age of the universe and for how we as human beings are connected to other living things through the process of evolution. I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. I came to that in my 20s, not as something I learned as a child. I find no conflict between what science is teaching us about these facts of the universe and ourselves and what I know about the Creator God as a God who had an intention of putting together a universe that could support interesting life ultimately human life in God's image. But I also think that God gave us curiosity and the ability to explore what's around us as understanding better what creation we've been given. In that regard, the young earth view really can't be supported uh, by a ream of data that comes from many different directions. As to Adam and Eve, I don't know the answer to that. A website has recently been launched uh, through a foundation I've started called the BioLogos Foundation that aims to try to re provide responses to the 30 most frequently asked questions that skeptics and believers post, and this is one of them. Uh, were Adam and Eve literal creatures? Well, I think I could say they certainly were not created from the dust in a way that makes them disconnected from the rest of life. The science won't support that. But were they perhaps historical Neolithic farmers that God chose to identify as the first homo divinus, if you will, infused uh, with the opportunity for free will and of the moral law? Possibly so. Or were they actually representative of the point at which the human race had arrived where God was capable at that point of deciding that we had arrived at, a, at a, a juncture where those human characteristics could be fully formed. I don't know. A book that you might want to point people to is one by Dennis Alexander called Creation or Evolution? Do We Have to Choose? Which goes through a number of these arguments in a very helpful way from the perspective of a, of a believer. Okay, so you would say uh, we have descended from the great ape. 
That's part of our genealogy. That's part of what your DNA tracking has discovered. And I know that's a troubling conclusion for many believers who find that incompatible with their sense of themselves and with their reading of Genesis. But I would challenge those who are uneasy about that to actually look at the evidence and to accept the fact that God gives us the ability to learn about creation. And that could hardly be a threat to God if we are getting more of that information. Yes, when you study our DNA and that of our closest relatives, the great apes, there can be no question that we share a common ancestor. So the idea that Adam and Eve are actually listed in the genealogy of Jesus, God's son, how do you square that off? Again, I think reasonable people may disagree about exactly how to put that together. I would point out, though, that as far back as 400 AD, when St. Augustine was trying to understand the meaning of Genesis, Augustine would have been the first to say that there is not sufficient evidence from a careful reading of that scripture in Genesis and from trying to understand what it meant uh, to the audience it was written for to answer those questions. Somehow we, in the last 150 years, particularly in the United States and Canada, have adopted a very narrow view of the only acceptable interpretation of Genesis, which was not the perspective of other thoughtful observers and readers and theologians down through the centuries. Okay, and because your view is um, theistic evolution. You believe yeah. the world began 14 billion years ago out of nothingness. But why would you need a God then, theistic evolution? Why would you need a God for that? Oh, for lots of reasons. So I do believe God gave us two books. God gave us the book of God's words, the Bible, and God gave us the book of God's works, uh, which is nature. And those are ways of learning about the nature of God in ourselves, and we should not be afraid to read both of them. The evidence uh, from a variety of directions is that, in fact, the universe is almost 14 billion years old. But it doesn't explain how it got here. So one of the reasons we need a God is to answer the question, what happened before the Big Bang? How did the universe come into being? Nature has not been observed to create itself. You can only get there by admitting the possibility, in fact, the necessity of a God who is outside of nature and outside of time. 